In the first lecture this morning, I asked you to imagine freedom, not just political freedom, but moral freedom, freedom from unchosen duties, the freedom to live for yourself. And I argued that there were certain moral principles and certain values that you need to embrace if you choose to live, values and principles that support your life because they're grounded in the nature of human life. Ayn Rand makes the point in Atlas Shrugged in these words. Man's life is the standard of morality, but your own life is its purpose. If existence on earth is your goal, you must choose your actions and values by the standard of that which is proper to man for the purpose of preserving, fulfilling, and enjoying the irreplaceable value which is your life. The fundamental way that human beings survive is by using reason. To sustain and enjoy your life, you need to pursue the values that will really contribute to it by the means that will really achieve them. If you pursue values that will harm your life, you might get them, which would be bad for you. And if you pr try to pursue values that would support your life, by means that don't actually lead to them, you're not likely to get them. And that, too, would be bad for you. And since you need to live in the real world, you need to identify the relevant facts of reality. If you act on premises that are contrary to the facts of reality, you're not acting according to knowledge of what real values are and how to obtain them. The only way you, as a human being, can know what the relevant facts of reality are is by using reason, by focusing on reality, as we discussed in the previous lecture. If you let something other than reason guide you, you are likely to choose actions that won't lead you to real values, because you won't be acting on knowledge of real values and of how to get them. Your feelings, for example, are based on what's already in your subconscious. They may be wrong, and since they result from a process that's not transparent to you, you're not in a good position to tell. If you go by what you're already committed to, you may be preserving a mistake that you could correct, or you may be reaching a conclusion based on evidence that doesn't actually support that conclusion. And, of course, if you adopt a principle based on faith, that is, without evidence, you have no reason to think that it's true. But that doesn't mean that you automatically follow reason. Reason doesn't work automatically. You only think if you choose to think. And you only think about those things that you need to think about if you choose to think about the things that you need to think about. So if you don't choose to think about the things you need to know in order to act effectively in support of your life, you won't know these things, and you won't be able to act effectively in support of your life. What do you need to think about? Well, you have to figure that out. You have to think about that, considering the importance and the urgency of various issues. If you're on the verge of starvation, you need to think about getting food in the immediate future unless you're so confused about metaphysics that it's keeping you from eating, you shouldn't think about metaphysics at that particular moment. If you need to get a new job, you shouldn't think too much about how you're going to accomplish the move to a new city if you get a new job in a new city. Unless, of course, you're concerned you might not be able to do it at all. The time to think about how to do the move is once you know that you need to move there. Because you need to direct all your actions to the pursuit of values, and the way you do that is by using reason, you need to act rationally always and in everything. And since being rational is a matter of choice, you need to choose rationality consistently. 
And that means you need a principle of acting rationally. A principle is a statement that condenses a lot of evidence, a lot of thought, into a simple, general fact of reality. A moral principle is a principle about human life that calls for action. Because you need to act rationally at all times, but you can't always review the argument, you need a principle of rationality that says, if I want to pursue values, I need to do so by applying reason. Virtue also involves developing a subconscious disposition. That does not mean you can make reason automatic. It means you can get in the habit of engaging reason so that you don't always have to consciously ask, well, should I use reason or should I just go with my gut? That means recognizing the principle, acting on it, and appreciating its importance so fully that the choice to think becomes natural and comfortable. Zoning out becomes alarming and unpleasant. You always need to make the choice to use reason. Habit alone never suffices. But you can make your subconscious support the right choice. Each virtue is the recognition of a principle at both the conscious and the subconscious level. And now is a good time to remember that happiness is joy without contradiction. What you feel when you're attaining your values without working against them. And reason is your means of pursuing whatever values you pursue, including life itself. So if you adopt any value that's contrary to reason, that is, if you value any commitment, even at the expense of rationality, you put yourself in a position where the pursuit of one value works against your other values. And that limits your potential for happiness. But if you learn to value reason and to practice it consistently, then as you pursue your values, you will also have the pleasure of experiencing the value of reason. And of course, what you're doing in practicing rationality is pursuing values. And you'll enjoy them when you achieve them. Thus, rationality, like all the virtues, tends towards happiness. And of course, since reason is how you pursue the values that sustain your life, rationality contributes to survival. And since flourishing is living in the manner of a rational animal, practicing rationality is a big part of it. And since self-esteem is most fundamentally the conviction that your mind is competent to deal with reality, as you see yourself thinking rationally, understanding the world, and achieving values that way, you can expect to develop self-esteem. And since rationality enables you to understand the world, it supports your conviction that the world is a place you can understand and act in, brightening your sense of life. If you want to understand the world, you need to identify the facts. I emphasize that word. You need to identify the facts. Thinking is an individual process, something one person does. If you rely on someone else's assertions, you expose yourself to risks of error that you can't control. And the more blindly you rely on someone else's statements, the more exposed you are to errors. Maybe the other person is lying. Maybe the other person is mistaken. Maybe the other person is repeating something he doesn't dare challenge. And maybe the other person is, in fact, stating a fact. If you simply accept his say-so, you have no way of figuring out which is the case. And if you accept his say-so as unchallengeable, and it happens to be the case that he's wrong, you prevent yourself from correcting the false belief that you adopt from him. And thinking is of the essence of a rational life. So if you let others do your thinking, you're not living as a rational human being. That is, you're not living according to man's nature. 
Moreover, you have a special sort of access to your own mind. You can think about how you're thinking. You can follow the steps of your own reasoning and make sure you're being rational. You can't do that with other people's minds. And the purpose of doing that thinking is to enable you to know reality. Reality is what you need to know in order to act effectively and support your life. But if you focus on what other people think, you're not focusing directly on reality. Of course, the fact that someone else says something or thinks something is a fact of reality. Sometimes it may be a fact you need to consider. But you need to make sure that you don't let his opinion take the place of the facts that his opinion is about. That's the virtue of independence. The image I've chosen for the slides on independence comes from Star Trek The Next Generation. In this scene, Captain Picard has been taken prisoner by some Cardassians. For those unfamiliar with Star Trek, this pale kind of reptilian looking guy is a Cardassian. He's being tortured and his tormentor, this Cardassian, asks him how many lights there are. The captain insists on saying four because he sees that it is true, as you can see. And he says that even though his tormentor wants him to say and to accept that there are five. In a way, what Captain Picard is doing here is a heroic display of independence. He's refusing, even under torture, to let someone else's will replace his judgment of the facts. And yet there's arguably a mistake in what Captain Picard does. Independence does not mean refusing to consider what others will do. If I were in the position the captain is in here, I might well say there were five lights as soon as I realized that's what the guy torturing me wanted me to say. I certainly wouldn't try to think there were five lights. I might not even try to make him think I thought there I might, however, try to stop him from doing what he's doing by just saying explicitly, OK, you want me to say the words, there are five lights? I'll say the words, there are five lights. What words would you like me to say next? Just adopt openly a premise of saying whatever words and not meaning them. So that would be one way of dealing with the torturer here. But the important thing to remember is that you need to focus on what the reality is. The reality of the lights, the reality of the torture in this case. And that applies in much more uh, ordinary circumstances as well. If what you think is the best thing to do might get you fired or arrested, well, you need to consider that. You need to weigh those consequences. But in order to weigh them rationally, you need to first consider what you actually think is the case. And then consider the costs and benefits of each option. If your boss demands you do something that's worse than giving up your job, if he demands that you do something, that would utterly destroy the value that you find in your work, well then, you refuse, even if that means giving up your job. But you don't refuse every single time the boss makes a decision that you think is mistaken. Now, that said, you do need to be careful that you don't become too attuned to what other people think instead of to the underlying facts, and that can be a struggle. Independence also does not mean it disregarding the evidence of other people's testimony. The fact that someone says something is a fact, but to make rational use of that fact, you need to consider it in the context of the other evidence that you have. You need to consider, for example, whether you have any evidence to back up or refute what the other person is saying. 
you need to consider whether he's in a position to know what he's talking about, whether he's likely to be telling you the truth to the best of his ability. What do you know of his character? What do you know of his incentives? If your honest friend who just came in says it's hot out, you can judge he's probably telling the truth. The best explanation for the fact that he's telling you it's hot out is that it's hot out and he knows it. If, on the other hand, your colleague, the practical joker, sees you trying to decide whether to wear your jacket and he says it's hot out, one very possible explanation of his conduct is that he's pranking you and it is not, in fact, hot out and you're going to walk out there and it's going to be freezing. If someone says there are five lights when you can plainly see that there are four, you know that he's saying something false. And the question then becomes why? Is he mistaken? Is he lying? Is he trying to subvert your grip on reality? What's going on? If you want to know the truth, you need to consider the evidence and evaluate it for yourself. Finally, independence does not mean not seeking advice or instruction. Otherwise, it would be kind of silly for us to have a course. It means judging what other people say. Maybe someone else's advice will call your attention to an aspect of a situation that you had not considered or had not given enough weight. Maybe a lecture will lay out a convincing argument or help you organize the evidence that you already have. Maybe you'll be able to verify what the lecturer says. Maybe the lecturer's testimony, when you consider the reasons you have to think he's being honest and the reasons you have to think he knows his subject will be good enough. Again, the important thing is to judge and to remain willing to judge. Independence, of course, contributes to self-esteem because by focusing on reality, you can see yourself as someone who is engaged in living in the world. And you can know because you're judging your own actions, that you're acting successfully in the world. On the other hand, if you focus on others' opinions, it may turn out that your actions are not efficacious in reality. And if you base your self-respect on other people's judgment of your merit, your self-esteem is in their hands and they can destroy it. And independence is part of flourishing because it means you're doing your own mental living, not trying to get someone else to do that essential aspect of living for you. You might ask, isn't independence just rationality? And in a sense, you'd be right to ask it. If you fail to think for yourself, then you're not practicing rationality. You can't practice rationality without also practicing independence. But all the virtues relate to one another. And since practicing every virtue is the rational thing to do, rationality, in a sense, implies all the other virtues. That's why rationality is called the master virtue of objectivism. But the fact that we need to think for ourselves instead of leaving that task to others is a particularly important fact to remember. So we need the guidance of an additional virtue. In general, we have distinct virtues because there are distinct facts that we need to remember if we're going to live effectively. And not bothering to think about something because others have done so, or not being willing to think about something because others do not think the same way, can be a particularly tempting vice. So we need a virtue to remind us not to do it. There are two basic ways to gain value from dealing with other people. Trade on one hand, and coercion or predation on the other. Coercion is forcing people to do what you want. In a sense, stealing is a form of coercion because it redirects the, the other person's past efforts embodied in his or her property, to your purposes against his will. 
Trade, by contrast, is voluntary. It's gaining value in social interactions by giving value for value, consensually, to mutual advantage. Giving value for value means that I give you something that contributes to your life and you give me something that contributes to my life. But it's not just something valuable that makes a value for trade. It's something the other person actually does value, something he seeks to gain. Producing products for trade is a way of sustaining one's life because those products are actually valued by others and can therefore be exchanged directly by barter or indirectly by means of money for something that contributes more directly to one's own life. Seeking trades to mutual advantage honors the principle that each person should seek his own good, and it honors that principle in two ways. First, because you're seeking your own gain, you're acting on the premise that your own good is the purpose of your action. Second, you're treating the other person as the purpose of his own action by acknowledging that he has no reason to trade with you unless he also gains that way. If you want him to seek more interactions with you, you need to make sure that his interactions with you are to his benefit. If trade is to mutual advantage, why does it need to be voluntary? That recognizes the principle that each person needs to act on his own independent judgment. If I impose something on you for your own good, I'm denying you the opportunity to judge your own good. That's depriving you of a key aspect of living, acting on your own judgment. And that's a threat because even if I happen to be right that you ought to choose what I'm imposing on you, I'm denying you the opportunity to protect yourself from any errors I might make. Thus, for example, when Dagny Taggart needs a crew for the first train on the John Galt line, she asks for volunteers. She doesn't just take for granted that just because they're willing to operate routine trains, any Taggart crew will be willing to be the first to cross the Reardon Metal Bridge. And when Directive 10289 is passed, binding workers to their jobs, Dagny doesn't just quit because she's not willing to be a slave. She says she won't work as a slave or a slave driver. The paradigm of trade is a straightforward commercial trade, such as buying lunch at a food truck. But trade is much more than that. It includes, of course, long-term relationships in business, such as employment. But it also includes social relationships, such as friendships. In a friendship, you don't keep track of exactly who owes what to whom. You do favors more freely than that. Nor are friendships only about trading favors. They also include such matters as the pleasure you take in the other person's company. But you do expect that on the whole, both parties will benefit from the friendship. Otherwise, it's not a friendship worth having. If you commit to living by production and trade, and not by predation, you develop over time the character of a trader. That means you're on the lookout for opportunities to trade with people opportunities to gain value by offering value. And you're not on the lookout for opportunities to prey on people. Your reputation should develop accordingly. If people see you as a source of value rather than a threat, they have reason to seek you out instead of trying to avoid or destroy you. When you trade, you give other people the respect that they deserve. And there are two kinds of justice and respect involved. First, there's a general respect that's due to all traders. The respect of acknowledging them as human beings who need to pursue their own good and who exist for their own sake, not for yours. And you show them that respect when you deal with them by seeking opportunities for trade. 
Second, when you decide to trade with another person, you implicitly acknowledge that that person has some value to offer you. You show respect for that value. And that leads us to the broader field of justice. To decide how to interact with other people, you need to evaluate them rationally, to know what they are likely to do and how they affect your life. People vary, morally and otherwise. Some people are tremendous sources of value. Others are tremendous sources of danger. Seen here is Larry Page, one of Google's founders, original programmers, and executives. Some people think he's a tremendous source of danger. He is, in fact, a great source of value. It's very valuable to know whether a person is a source of value or a threat. Encouraging people to be better sources of value can lead to more value in the world for you. And discouraging threats can help keep you safe. More importantly, you get to choose most of your associates. And in doing so, you need to evaluate them accurately in order to estimate what effect associating with them will have on your life. Remember, you need to seek value in everything you do. So you need to make sure that all your relationships are valuable. And what value there is in a relationship depends largely on who the other person is. And that's why we need the virtue of justice, which we practice by objectively evaluating other people. The principle that you need to evaluate other people objectively in order to seek value and avoid harms applies to all your relationships. Your spouse, friends, employers, employees, professionals you work with, merchants you buy from, teachers, students, relatives, what have you. You need to seek value in everything you do, and that includes all your relationships. So you need to deal justly with everyone. As with all tasks of identifying reality, judging others takes work. You can't afford to put the same care into picking the person who sells you a candy bar that you put into picking a person to marry. Of course, the more carefully you judge a person, the more you can rely on that judgment. Although your moral character is relevant to your fitness for all kinds of relationships, justice isn't only about moral judgment. It's about whatever is relevant. So, for example, if you're trying to pick someone to translate Chinese, well, it would be unjust to hire me, because I don't speak Chinese. If you're picking someone to be friends with, Having a similarity of sense of life and a similarity of purpose will be relevant. I, for example, tend to enjoy the company of people who crusade for causes, even if I don't agree with their causes. It takes a lot of time and effort to discern what value another person has to offer. And it takes investment to develop relationships with others. And to some extent, if that investment is to succeed, it has to begin before you have adequate evidence of the value that the other person offers. Moreover, there's value in being in a community of people who are doing well. And a person is not necessarily entirely without value just because he has some flaw, even some moral flaw. For both reasons, we need a virtue concerned with prospecting for human gold, so to speak, with looking for the potential for valuable relationships with others. That virtue, which David Kelly introduced, is called benevolence. Benevolence calls our attention to the good potential that may exist even in a flawed person. It asks us to remember 
that we haven't seen everything about a person. Now, that doesn't mean that we disregard the flaws. Benevolence is not in contradiction to justice. It does mean that we don't rush to condemn, that we continue to look for good potential, even you know, in those that we don't know about and those that we don't know enough about, that we continue where it isn't overwhelmed to value that which is good, even in a person in whom we've seen some bad. Benevolence includes extending assistance to others, including in the context of relationships, but even beyond that. Benevolence can include material assistance, such as emergency rescue, based on the potential value of the other person. Benevolence also reminds us of the value of the custom of helping people in emergencies, because after all, you might be in an emergency at some point. And often in such cases, there's a lot more value to be gained by the person receiving assistance than it costs the person providing it. Benevolence also includes spiritual assistance. That is, assistance pertaining to the person's character and mind. Spiritual assistance can come in the form of offering opportunities, as can material assistance. Spiritual assistance can come in the form of offering incentives or offering advice. One form of spiritual assistance that I offer is something I call your life is worth an hour, where I've made a commitment to everybody I know, even just well enough to be Facebook friends, that if you're considering killing yourself, I'm willing to give an hour of my time talking to you and trying to help you see the value in your own life. Why is this valuable to me? Because if the person really does have potential, and I've helped him decide to live, I hope to get some benefit from that potential through friendship and other forms of trade. Benevolence isn't mentioned in Galt's speech, but the speech itself can be understood as an act of benevolence. Giving that speech took a lot of effort. He had to write the speech, and he had to hijack the country's airwaves to make himself heard. The people listening haven't done anything for him. Their only effort is to turn on the radio, to hear what they expect will be a speech by Galt's enemy. Most of them, presumably, haven't done anything to go on strike or reject the looter's code. If things keep going the way they're going, most of those people will starve to death. Why does John Galt give them a speech to give them a chance? And why does he want to give them a chance? Because he realizes that they have the potential to be of value to him, even if they're not very valuable yet. If they're rational enough to want to know what's going on, maybe they'll be rational enough to do something about it, to let the looter state collapse, and to make sure they survive. And then he'll be able to trade with them in the world he will have built. Galt uses the word owes. I don't think that's literally true. John Galt's speech isn't a payment of a debt. It's an act of benevolence. Surviving the collapse of the looter's state and being part of his new world is only part of what he's inviting them to do. More importantly, he's inviting them to return to reason and to pursue the value of their own lives. He wants to trade with them again, but only once they recognize what they are capable of and live up to it. You failed to recognize the hero in your soul, and you failed to know me when, you passed, when I passed you on the street, he says. When you cried in despair for the unattainable spirit which you felt had deserted your world, you gave it my name but what you were calling was your own betrayed self-esteem. You will not recover one without the other. If Galt only exercised justice, he might say, they don't think they can accomplish much, and the way they're living, they're right. Sure, they have potential, but through their own choices, they've let it go to waste. But Galt goes beyond justice. 
he acts with benevolence and says, they could still recover their self-esteem. They could choose to think. And they could choose to live. And I want them to do that. What about the other side of looking for relationships? How you present yourself? Should you make yourself look as valuable as you can? Even more valuable than you are? No, Ayn Rand warns, the unreal is unreal and can have no value. Love, respect, or fame obtained by deceiving others is in a very real sense unreal. It's unreal because love, respect, or fame directed to a false image of who you are isn't love, respect, or fame directed towards the real you. It doesn't give you the experience of being valued, that is, of being valued for who you are. Indeed, it denies you that experience because the people who see the false image of you may include the people you'd like to have see the real you, the people who'd actually value the real you. Because rational, perceptive people are able to understand the world and act effectively in it, there's value in dealing with them. But if your methods of dealing with people rest on deceiving them, then the rationality and perceptiveness of the people you deal with becomes a threat. You have to act to preserve their errors. After all, if they realize that you did not have the value you deceived them into thinking you had, they will, in justice, have less reason or no reason to continue to deal with you. Thus, if you deceive others, you have to try to escape their perception possibly even by seeking out people who have less ability to judge, but who therefore have less value to offer you. Having to focus on the false images you create for others may distract you from the real world and get you confused between the true and the false. And that's not just the case in the sense in which spending too much time in a fictional world can get in the way of paying attention to reality you may have to live in reality according to what only makes sense in the false world your false persona lives in. For example, in order to maintain your image, you may need to avoid pursuing what you value in order not to be seen pursuing it. That's one way in which deception produces unhappiness, sending you off after false values. Here's another. Living by deception makes other people's perceptiveness a threat. And that threat, being always present, is a source of fear. When you gain value because someone has misperceived what you offer or offered, even if you didn't cause the error, you aren't gaining that value through producing the equivalent. It's unearned, or at least hasn't been judged to be earned. And that means you aren't sustaining your life by means of trade. It also means that you are living in an unreal world created by that mistake, thus separating yourself from reality. For all these reasons, we need to practice the virtue of honesty, the recognition that the unreal is unreal and can have no value. It's a commitment to keeping our interactions with others grounded in reality. One of the most famous moments in Ayn Rand's novel, The Fountainhead, comes when Howard Rourke, an architect and the main character of the book, is asked to modify one of his designs in violation of his architectural principles. He refuses. And he refuses even though there would be a lot of money and a lot of future opportunities available to him if he accepted the proposal. And comes at a time when he's very short of money. He refuses because he understands that if he becomes a rich and famous architect this way, he won't be able to do architecture his way. He won't be able to do the work he loves in the way he loves. The people who hire him will expect more of this sort of work. He'll have to betray his professional purpose at every step. This is the virtue 
of integrity. Integrity means putting your judgment into action. Not just thinking that something is the right thing to do, but actually doing it. It means that you don't just claim to hold principles, you live by them. And that means that integrity reflects the recognition of a fundamental fact of human nature, that reason is our tool of survival. If it is in order to live by them that we have ethical principles in the first place. It is in order to work by them that we have professional principles. And you live by your principles because you recognize that your principles are in fact principles about what works in reality. And that your real interest, even when you're tempted to do otherwise, lies in following those principles. Integrity also means recognizing that you are yourself, that you are an individual with a personal identity. You have chosen a certain purpose and certain values, and if you want to attain them, you have to actually pursue them. Indeed, if you do not act to pursue your values, you don't really value them at all. An architect who would do whatever his clients wanted wouldn't be someone who valued a particular vision of architecture. He'd be someone who merely valued getting paid or being famous. Integrity is necessary for happiness, because if you let yourself stroll away from your real values and principles, the values you pursue will be contradictory to the ones that are most meaningful to you. And your joy will be compromised by the recognition that you are all abandoning those higher values. Integrity is part of flourishing, because the life of a rational man isn't just a life in which you think it's a life in which you're guided by your thinking. And assuming your principles are in fact the principles that have followed tend toward survival, integrity contributes to survival by seeing to it that you actually follow those principles. As integrity emphasizes, man doesn't just live by thinking, but by thinking and acting. Reason is your tool of survival. But a tool just sitting there doesn't accomplish anything. You need to apply it to the problem of survival. And that means producing the values that sustain you. A human life is a life of production. We don't just find what we need in the world, we create it. Fundamentally, the virtue of productiveness is the recognition that you need to support yourself by creating the value you need to live. That means recognizing that you want, I could even say need, values, and that you can achieve them. And creating values requires making the choice to focus your mind on creating values. Man, unlike other animals, adapts his environment to himself. Productiveness is the virtue by which we do that. And the productive person produces a lot, not just the minimum he needs in order to survive. He produces because he finds joy in creating value. Joy, after all, is the emotional response to achieving one's values. He esteems himself for the challenges he sees himself meet. He's chosen his work because he loves that kind of work. He wants to do it more and better. Hank Reardon, you may recall, took whatever time he could away from his executive responsibilities to invent Reardon Metal. And of course, the more he produces, the more wealth he has available for both consumption and future production. A productive person is primarily concerned with his own creations, not with those of others. Yet the creations of others may inspire him and challenge him to surpass them. There's no limit to human achievement, and the productive person accepts none. This is the theme of Brian Larson's painting, A New Height. 
which shows an architect watching the rise of his own building next to the old World Trade Center. The painting, interestingly enough, was created while the plot to destroy the Twin Towers was being developed. And shortly after 9-11, the objectivist gallery owner, Quint Cordaire, wrote, this image stands in lucid contrast, in defiance of those who would destroy. It is a reaffirmation of who we are, of what we've created, of what we've built, of what we will rebuild and build higher yet, with unthwarted and unconquered determination. Productiveness reflects and demonstrates the proposition that you can shape the world to suit you. The key actions under it are those by which you shape the world, identifying ways to create value and creating it. Since the virtue is about creating the value that sustains human life, what the productive person creates is objective value, values that actually do contribute to human life. But you don't create value in the abstract. The value you create is the value you've chosen it as your productive purpose to create. It's a value that's of personal importance to you and that you love creating. At the same time, since you sustain yourself by means of trade, you need to create something that others value so that they'll pay you for it. By creating value, you actually see yourself shaping the world, and you see that the world is a place that you can shape. There's a distinction that I think is important to make when talking about productiveness. And that's the distinction between productiveness and productivity. Productiveness is a matter of moral virtue pertaining to focusing on creating value, whereas productivity measures the value that you create. So, for example, a brilliant person may produce a lot of value when he troubles himself to bother producing at all, but yet he may waste a lot of his time. He's not being very productive in the moral sense, even if he is in the sense of productivity. A moral person, on the other hand, who doesn't have a lot of intelligence, may work a lot of hours and work those hours to the best of his ability, and yet not produce a great deal of value. To give a more concrete example, consider two people working in the same law office. One is a highly intelligent senior partner in the firm. Even if he only sits down to work a few hours a day, he may yet produce more value than the hardest working janitor in the building. And yet, in terms of the virtue of productiveness, the janitor is the one earning more respect. Producing value makes it possible to achieve existential independence. Independence in action, not just in thought. But existential independence isn't just producing value. It's relying on that value to support yourself. That means not seeking value by force. And it also means not seeking value through mere charity, through gifts that aren't based on what you contribute to the giver's life and values. One reason to pursue this sort of independence is that those who are willing to give you what you haven't earned aren't likely to be able to give you very much. Those who've made money and are in, therefore in a position to give it away have made it by pursuing value and not by wasting it. That means they're not likely to be the sort of person to give you money if they don't see a prospect of gaining something by it. How much, they, if anything, they give you will depend on the value you offer in exchange or the potential value that you represent. You can come to represent a lot of potential value, of course, and thereby deserve a lot of assistance, as in the case of earning scholarships. But that is still earning value, albeit not as reliable a way of earning value as trading for value that you've already produced. 
most of us have the experience of being dependent as minors and often in the first years thereafter. When you're in that position, you're largely at the mercy of the people that you're dependent on. You may live in their house. You may realize that you're not prepared to support yourself if they stop funding you. And that means you have to worry about keeping them happy and not offending them. If you were living by trade and doing a sufficiently good job of it to know that your services were in demand, you'd know that a given customer or employer or donor, if you're in the nonprofit sector, is not indispensable. You could lose a deal or a job and move on. Moreover, if you're offering real value, anyone who stops dealing with you has to give up that value. For example, if your employer fires you because he doesn't like your politics, assuming you're not somebody working in a political or politics-related position, and you know, you're a productive employee, then your employer not only finds himself down by one valuable employee, he may well see his competitor hire you and gain your services and use them to compete against him. Existential independence is thus one way of making sure that you can use your judgment and pursue your happiness without unbearable costs. Life is a process of self-sustaining action, and an existentially independent person is sustaining himself in a sense in which a dependent is not. And self-esteem is the conviction that you are worthy to live and to pursue your own happiness. Existential independence makes sure that in making choices to pursue your own happiness, you don't have to support, subordinate other values to the need to please the person on whom you are dependent. More fundamentally, existential independence proves that you're worthy to live in a distinctive sense. If you're existentially independent, you're keeping yourself alive. When you expect another person to support you without getting anything out of it, when you ask him to live for you, even in part, you're, asking, you're sacrificing your own love of your own life in several ways. You're undermining your self-esteem by not showing yourself that you're worthy of life. You're denying yourself joy by getting someone else to give you values instead of achieving them for yourself. And you're denying yourself some values altogether because you can't afford to risk pursuing them or even claiming them. Whatever you achieve, you achieve it. Whatever value you produce, whatever moral character you develop, you are the one who does it. That is to say, your actions are taken by you, who you are, including your subconscious premises, your conscious premises, your dispositions. That includes your moral beliefs and the subconscious counterparts to those beliefs that you develop over the years of trying to live by them. In other words, it includes your virtues and your vices. Recognizing that and taking up the challenge to make yourself the best person you can be is the virtue of pride. And here's one of my favorite lines from Galt's speech. Man is a being of self-made soul. Pride recognizes that in order to have good actions and achieve good results, you need to shape your own character. That means you need to shape your character according to the right standards. And that means you need to choose your moral code carefully. You need to ch shape the premises that you consciously accept, both because your conscious principles are part of who you are and because they shape your subconscious dispositions. You need to shape your subconscious mind by all the various ways that are available to you to do that. By the conscious premises you adopt, by the habits you practice, by the pleasures you pursue, by the art that you enjoy. Nothing can take priority over shaping your own self because that's going to have ramifications for everything else that you do. 
What follows from that? You have to value your actions or disvalue potential actions based on their effect on your character. And you need to take the actions that will lead to developing the virtues. You need, for example, to be rational in small things, not only because being rational in small things gets you the value that's to be had in the big things, I'm sorry, in the small things, but because it contributes to having the virtue of rationality that you need for the big things too. All the virtues contribute to self-esteem, but pride has a special focus on it, because pride is the virtue focused on making yourself a person worthy of life in every sense. Indeed, all of the other virtues can be seen as the products of pride, because pride is the virtue of cultivating the virtues. The feeling of pride is the emotion most typical of a hero. A hero, after all, has much to be proud of. But it's the virtue of pride that nurtures the hero in your soul.